the fact that COVID is kind of, we are not going to rent a, um, a picnic shelter. We are not all going to crowd in at a picnic shelter. We are going to meet under the bridge Sunday morning for worship in a month, hopefully. Um, there's plenty of parking, plenty of space. We, I, I haven't talked to Mary about this yet. We will talk this week, but the plan is to do box lunches. Um, we can get them reasonably at a couple of different places. And so <clears throat> we aren't sharing any food and everything's going to be passed out. Just bring your own chair and something to drink. And we think that'd be about the safest way to do this. So I, I would just, we have just spent so long apart. I just, I mean, if, if we get to the place where we shouldn't be gathered together outdoors, then we will. But I can't imagine that that would be, a, that that would be an issue. So I am looking forward um, to getting together for a church picnic in a month, e even if we all have to, you know, not get crowded together. So just um, be careful who you hug on this morning. Just ask you to be, be careful about who you're hugging on this morning. Um, this is three feet, in case you're wondering. Unless you're, you know, you're under five feet, then that's probably not three feet. Um, but other than that, that's about three feet. Um, I think that that is everything. We are at the end of the week. Just so that you were aware, I know that this is right at the top of your list. Uh, charge conference materials have been delivered to my inbox. I know you're all excited about that. Uh, we've been given a date of October 25th, and maybe we'll get it done, and maybe we won't, and maybe that'll be the date, and maybe it won't. So just to let you know, if you're as excited about filling out year-end reports as I always am, it's that time of year again. So nominating committee, if you're on it, be warned. I was thinking about calling it the appropriate name, but that's silly because it's the nominating committee, and it has been for the 15 years we've been calling it something else. So on that cheery note on that uh, that cheery cheery note right let's stand up and sing. we're gonna stand up and sing and focus on god and not paperwork this morning <laughs> so stand up and get your get your worship on this morning
so happy that you are here to worship with us. Um, our next song is How He Loves Us. Oh 
final song for this morning is Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. It is our fervent prayer request this morning that if you wash the dish towels and dishcloths in the kitchen here, if you would return them before tomorrow morning, the guys will be able to wash the dishes. I'm just, just saying that would be a good thing. Um, Mike and Cheryl Tilly celebrated their 44th wedding anniversary, so if you see them, um, and, and Cheryl's online, so you know if you all are 
popping in and out of the service. I, I know Debbie does. I don't know if anybody else pops in and out of the service, but Cheryl is probably sitting there online this morning, so happy anniversary, Cheryl. Um, <clears throat> as we do round two with the variants, um, I had a story shared with me this week, and some of you are old enough to remember um, some of you aren't quite old enough to remember. Um, I only barely go back to the Vietnam War, so that tells you how old you have to be if you remember World War II. Um, and you may not be aware that during World War II, folks um, got coupons for sugar and milk, and copper was in short supply. Everything was in short supply. And the person who was telling me this rather brief story was commenting that you never heard anyone during the war effort complain. You never heard them gripe and say, nobody's going to tell me what to do. They all looked after each other, and they all looked after the war effort, and they all looked after the soldiers out in the field. So I just thought, that was a, sh a story worth sharing this morning, um, something, to, something to think about um, this week. Um, so Graham is back with us this morning, not to say that he was alive during World War II and might be telling those stories, but um, he's got a couple cracked ribs, but he's back here this morning, so it's good to have you back. Graham um, was out to see uh, Butch and Bootsy, and... If I didn't, I'm hoping I didn't misunderstand Bootsy, but she said, if you wish to come and visit, you may come visit. Um, you just be prepared to stay a bit. And um, I just, uh, I felt like I really needed to take my shoes off at the front door. Um, not because she has a white carpet. I can't even tell you what color her carpet is. But because by the time she and Butch got done talking about where they have been, over the last 19 months, um, you really feel as though you have, you have walked on holy ground. Um, it has been a hard, hard journey, um, but what you hear from them is how faithful God has been over the last 19 months for them. And you get to hear how faithful God's people have been to them um, over the last 19 months. And I don't fault them for praying for a big miracle, but they don't miss. They don't miss the small stuff either. So um, for those of you who have had opportunity to share with them, um, they just wanted to say thank you, and you do not know how much it has meant. And if they could find a way to get back here and tell you themselves, they would. Um, but it was just uh, an, an honor um, an honor to hear about their, their journey over the last 19 months and how faithful God has been. Um, so, um, speaking of which, you want to remember Dick and Mary as well and uh, ask that you would uh, pray for them especially. Um, and the Sheilers, um, John is, is doing okay. Butch, you doing okay? Okay. Um, and remember to pray for the Wills who have, uh, have COVID and Betty Turner who has uh, Lyme's disease. There we go. It's, it'll come to me eventually. Nathan's grandmother, um, the other one, uh, is uh, going to go meet with the doctors this week and I suspect that they will come up with some sort of course of treatment. I was very excited because they moved everything up and aren't um, doing all that kind of stuff and just making things last, um, given the kind of cancer they're dealing with, that was, that was really good to hear. Um, it probably won't be good news, but at least you're moving along. And when you have, you have to move faster than the cancer, okay? Let's just, let's just put it that way when you're, when you're doing treatment. So I believe that that is absolutely everything. Yes, ma'am. My wife's sister is having surgery this week. Um, her brother-in-law uh, passed away this past week from COVID. And her other brother-in-law 
none of which are her husband, that's his, her other brother-in-law, um, is in the hospital with COVID. Uh, fortunately, he had one shot. So I shudder to think where he would be um, if he had had no shots. But one shot was better than no shots, so he's, he's doing okay. So if you would just remember to pray for my wife's family, that would, that would cover that all. They had a good time. Sat down with them. the girls. The girls all got together. You know how that goes if you have girls in your family. And sat down with their mom and packed stuff up and told stories and got getting the house ready to sell and go on the market, which is, is traumatic in one sense, but you get to... You get to laugh at the afros and the big hair of the 80s and all those other pictures that you pull out. So, um, Some of the rest of you are doing that too, so God bless you. Um, and there are some, some unspoken requests floating around and we have folks going through all kinds of stuff. Um, so if you would uh, remember the folks around you in prayer, shall we bow our heads for a word of prayer? We ask this morning, O oh God, that you would open the eyes of our hearts. First of all, that we might see you. And that you might fill our vision and fill our senses. That we might come into your presence and kneel before you. And the first thing we do this morning, O oh God, is we give you thanks that there are children, your children, in our midst who have suffered uh, so much and yet will lift their voices in praise to you, who struggle each and every day, each and every day with the circumstances they have been dealt in this life, and yet on whose lips we find a song of praise. And for that we give you thanks, O oh God. We remember this morning all those whom we have named, and there are folks we haven't named. Um, there are folks out there who are packing up houses, and there are folks who are trying to buy houses, and there are folks who are trying to sell houses, and there are folks who are trying to get out of town as fast as they can. We ask that you would be with them all. We ask, O oh God, that you rest your hands upon them and let your spirit dwell in them, and especially for those who are battling cancer this morning. It seems like all of a sudden there are so many of them that you would uh, sit beside them each and every day and talk to them when they, need, when they need inspiration and encouragement and let them know that they are not alone. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I guess the new transportation secretary for the school district is going to take the offering this morning. We see how long retirement lasted. So congratulations, Jeff. I'll keep you out of trouble for a little bit. So I, you all can find something else to be thankful for. Maybe you're thankful for that this morning.
There were a couple of things that we haven't been praying about that we probably should. Um, nursery workers. At some juncture, we need to have a nursery back up and running. Um, so if you'd all pray about that. We've uh, not had anything real stable or anything since I've been here, so it'd be nice um, to have somebody that isn't graduating in six months or 12 months or whatever. Um, so just be thinking about that and praying about that. The other thing that we don't talk about is the music director's position, and we have cast the net about as wide as we can this week, um, not getting anything locally, so um, through the traditional venues, so we are out online with that this week, so. Now this is interesting. Technology is a wonderful thing when it works. M Microsoft decided that it didn't want my sermon up, so there we go. There it is. Oh. actually acted like totally shut down. Anyway, here we go. From 1 Samuel, the 25th chapter, verses 23 through 28. Um, we're jumping around a little bit because we're following the kids in Sunday school, so they're jumping around a little bit. So we're back to the period of time, just so that you're aware, where David is not yet king. He is in the badlands of Engedi which I hope you get to see. I was the only one in the tour group who was so excited. Um, I waited years to see Mossad ever since Peter O'Toole was in that, uh, that movie. And then uh, you stand at the very top of Masada, which was pretty exciting to finally be there and uh, be in the place where that story took place. And then you look out and uh, I said, well, what is that? Is that? And he said, well, that's, that's the Engedi wilderness. That's, that's where David hung out and ran from from, from Saul, and then you look out and you can see. It stretches as far as the eye can see, and there is one small oasis in the middle of it, um, which has been there forever, and uh, that is where David is kind of hanging out. Um, you can walk to the Red Sea pretty easily from the oasis in En Gedi, so it's not, it's not real wide, but it's, it's, it's pretty long, so that's kind of where he is, and uh, Let's read the story and you'll find out one of the things that he was doing while he was out in the wilderness. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and alighted from the donkey. That means she got off, okay, that she didn't take her flashlight out. And fell before David on her face, bowing to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, Upon me alone, my lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. My Lord, do not take seriously this ill-natured fellow Nabal. <clears throat> that would be her husband, just so you know, ladies. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. So there you go. He's living up to his name. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent, now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, since the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt, that's a fancy way of saying coming in and taking out my husband, my family, and most of our servants. Since the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from taking vengeance with your own hand, we won't discuss what he's getting ready to do and is about to do. Now let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be like Nabal. And now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord, which would be a meal, okay, a picnic basket full of stuff. Please forgive the trespass of your servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, which is to say she's begging him not to fight his own personal battles, and wreak his own personal vengeance, but only fight the battles of the Lord. And evil shall not be found in you so long as you shall live. I'm not sure where I first heard it, but it doesn't matter. 
remembering it has been the problem over the years. Beauty is truth. And truth is beauty. We don't think much of beauty anymore. We don't worry about aesthetic anywhere near as much as we should. We live in an ugly world. We live in a world that is filled with flood and war and pestilence. And my friends, human suffering is ugly. And we have magnified it, blown it out of proportion, and we have given it a megaphone so that we will click, watch, and buy advertising time in the media that pervades this ugliness to us day in and day out. We live in an ugly world. People lie. Power is the currency of the day. People guard what little they have until they are shriveled in the attempt to hang on to what is theirs. With social media, we get a front row seat and an unending barrage of ugly, ugly human ego. And then it happens, doesn't it? And then it happens. I drive out of the Roanoke Valley just far enough at sunset. And I look up. Have you ever driven home from Roanoke? And you look up and you look across that valley at the mountains at sunset? Or hear the most amazing harmonies coming from the speakers in my car. I look up and there, once again for the first time, someone is showing me a magnificent work of art. They're all beautiful. And I am reminded that there is beauty in the world. And they speak to my heart of the handiwork of God. And the fact that beauty is truth. Hmm? Perhaps it is not the most complete expression of it, but maybe uncluttered by words and rationalization. Maybe it is. And this morning I want to share with you that Abigail is beautiful. Not in the white sexist misogynistic way. Okay, just get that out of there. And there is truth in beauty. I do not know what she looked like. And neither do you. But as we read her in this story, she was beautiful. And there's truth in beauty. And I want you to remember that as we unpack the story this morning. I want you to remember it because David was not beautiful in this story. David rampaged, David possessed murderous eyes, David had been insulted by Nabal in a way you or I cannot understand. David had whipped 400 men into a frenzy, and my friends, it was about to get ugly. David was full of himself, full of his pride, full of contempt for Nabal, and he was empty of God. You can't be in touch with God and be that ugly. I'm just saying. And there, kneeling before David, David, 
is Abigail. And she was beautiful. And she recovered God for David on that day. Abigail restored the beauty to David that day. And she offered it to him without price. She was beautiful. You have to understand, prior to this story, and we have read some of them and looked at some of them on Sunday morning, and the kids have studied some of those stories of David in Sunday school. David has done good work up until now. And David, too, has been beautiful, but not at this moment in this story. In the badlands of Engedi, he and his men protected Nabal fairly recently who was a wealthy herdsman. And when I say protected, I am in fact talking about sheep rustling. Okay? Now I don't know where you learned about sheep rustling. I learned about it from Bugs Bunny. Everything I learned about American culture and about classical music, I learned from Bugs Bunny. Because sheep were money, right? If you've had exposure to farm work, you know that animals are not just animals. That's your bread and your butter. It's your milk check every week while you're waiting for the crops to come in. And David and his men were a wall of protection for Nabal's herds, or so the scripture tells us. And my friends, it was sheep shearing time. We don't do sheep shearing. We don't do anything like sheep shearing. I didn't grow up in a land where there were lots of sheep, and I bet neither did you. But if you were to go to Australia or other places where sheep shearing is a big deal, it's the end of the year. We're pretty close to sheep shearing time as it is, and you go in and you sheep shear the sheep, not sheep the shear. We don't want to sheep the shear. But you shear the sheep... And essentially, it's like bringing your crops in for everybody else. And there is a big party, something akin to Thanksgiving. And you gather the family and the workers around the table like my grandma used to do at threshing time. She would tell the stories about rolling out that table and and putting all the extensions in it and bringing the guys in after they got done threshing in the fields. And she'd feed them all lunch and there would just be this big celebration all these guys sitting in her way too small dining room, I suspect. Pushed out onto the front porch and into the front lawn, I'll bet you anything. It was work filled with celebration and the fuzzy coats of the herd, and the year-end's harvest. And during the celebration, David sent ten men to ask for a share of the food from the banqueting table, which we believe was a reasonable request for services rendered. And it may even have been a culturally expected thing, an unwritten rule or law. Not only did Nabal refuse them, strike one, but as the story unfolds, Nabal then pretends not to even know who David is. Well, maybe he's one of those rabble-rousing thieves we have to watch out for with the sheep all year long. Well, there's strike two. First, you, you don't send him home with anything, and then you misconstrue him with the problem. And call him a thief? When he and his men have been standing between you and poverty all here. Nabal was ugly and vulgar and rude and entitled and arrogant. And as David responded to Nabal, Nabal 
was able to bring out the ugliness in David. David then became ugly with hate and revenge and hurt and pride. And I'm going to take just a moment for a brief aside this morning. Have you ever been insulted? I mean hurt and stomped on and thrown on the ground by somebody who is mean and ugly and vicious. If not, you got a 30-second nap coming while I talk to the other people. My question is, how did you respond? You see, that's always the question, and that is the question for David this morning. How do you respond? The question is not what was done to you. That's not the question. The question that is going to determine who you are, the existential question of the moment that defines who you are is not what was done to you. The question that is going to define who you are is how do you respond? And if they get you to act like them, it doesn't matter how bad you beat them to a pulp, they have won. You understand what I'm saying? Because you are no longer you. You have become them. And they've got you. Just a thought. As David lost his beauty and became as ugly as Nabal, there was no room for God at the table. Do you understand? God doesn't exist where there's all that ugliness because I'm thinking God is truth, right? We learn that somewhere along the line. David, who looked at the maniacal Saul, and when he looked at Saul and all of his craziness, saw only a temple of God. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? Saul is, is a crazy man at this point, hunting him down. And David looks at Saul, and he sees a temple of God and somebody to rever be revered and respected and honored and you don't take vengeance on him and then you turn to somebody like Nabal and now all of a sudden David sees no good in him at all none Nabal had succeeded in creating a Saul out of David in that moment David was one step away from becoming just like the king he was going to replace And in that moment, when the salvation of Israel hung by a thread and no one knew it, at that moment when David risked becoming exactly like Saul and finding a way to push God out of his life, there she was. There she was. Abigail. Abigail had gotten wind of David's ugly wrath in the air. And she packed a feast on the backs of her pack animals and she headed out to meet him and his band. And there she was. Abigail lay prostrate before David, begging him it's interesting what she begs. She does not beg for him to forgive her husband, who's a jerk. Can we all say that? Is, that? is that okay? Am I being sexist and misogynist and all that stuff? Nabal's a jerk. I mean, I I'm, I'm think she says that, so I think it's okay for me to say that. What she begs David for is to remember who God made him to be. Nabal was a fool. 
And she begged David not to be a fool as well. The story, and you read it, sort of steamrolls down this ugly, ugly path until you get to this point. You know, you can see the vengeance coming. You can see the swords out. You can see the 400 men ready to march. And it's all moving and moving and moving. And then all of a sudden, there is this woman laying in the path on the way to vengeance. And it stops everything. Abigail reverses the entire story and brings beauty back to one man's life. In a man's world, a woman brought beauty and peace back without a single weapon Without a single weapon, she turned the tide of battle. In a materialistic world of sheep and land and wool and feasts and money, she, she cleared all of that away and put love back on the table. Because beauty, beauty is truth. And truth returned to David's heart that day. In Abigail's beauty, David is able to see once again the beauty of God. There are fools aplenty in the world. I'm not getting an amen on that one, but I'll just assume it's there somewhere. And I want you to know that Nabal is not just one man. Nabal is a condition. Nabal could be anyone. And no sooner do we set ourselves about the business of setting the fools in this world right, because that's what good Christians do, right? That's our job, is to set those fools all right. That's, That's what we do then we realize we have become just like them. Just like them. And all of a sudden we realize that we are, we are hollering and we are angry and we are violent and we are mistrustful and we are ugly. We are ugly as Nabal. Or as my grandma used to say, ugly as sin. How true she was. There is nothing more common in the spiritual life. I I really want you to hear this. There is nothing more common in the spiritual life than starting out right and going wrong. If that has not been the case with you, you get a free pass from church from now on. Well, actually, you don't, because worship isn't about being right and wrong. Okay. I'm not sure what we'll let you out of, but for the rest of us, we all start out right, and somewhere down the road, we wind up wrong. And I want to share with you this morning that none of us is exempt from that. David was not exempt from that. We are off in our rage, and we are angry, and we are bitter, and we are seeking vengeance. And the bathroom pipes will never be the same. And then we see her, don't we? Then we see her, and we are stopped by her mere presence. You see, Abigail, too, isn't just a person, is she? Abigail could be a child, or she could be a friend, or she might even be a stranger who crosses our path but once. But this morning we will call her Abigail, 
even though she could be anyone. That person who has crossed our path confronts us with something very different than what we are feeling and doing in our ugly anger. Wrapped up in vengeance, we, we had forgotten about God. And in that person, in that person who has crossed our path, we are able to once again see ourselves wrapped up in God. Once more, because of that one person, we see the beauty of God. And beauty is truth, right? Beauty is truth. Abigail is beautiful. And beauty is truth. And truth is God. Would you pray with me? When we are angry, O oh God, when we are frustrated, when we are seeking vengeance, when we are not at our best, send Abigail to us. That she might disarm us and remind us of whose we are. That we might see the beauty of God and reflect the beauty of God and be the beauty of God once more. That we indeed may be bearers of the truth. Amen. Would you stand this morning and I will give you the benediction. I am certain that there is an Abigail who has crossed your path. And I send you forth this morning that you might give thanks for that person. But I know one other thing. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you to be Abigail. Hmm? Somebody out there this week will be ugly. And I know that your first response is going to be what my first response is. I need to be about a block over and inside so I don't see him, I don't touch him, I don't come into contact with that because it's a disease and it's catching. But think about it. Think about being Abigail. Think about being Abigail to the person who can't see or feel God anymore and who is as ugly as sin. May you go out and reflect the beauty of God and take that beauty to the people who have lost it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.
to see.